maximum setting now is the chloroplexis carcinoma in brain tumor. I've got something else. Yeah, I'm going to have to get some more
Definitely. You're in the dark there. Can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry. Wrong, wrong head. I had the wrong headphones on. Can you hear me okay? Hello, Natalie. I can't hear you. I can't hear. I think it's my microphone's okay. I think it's you. I can't hear. I can't hear. I think it's my microphone's okay. I think it's you. There you go. Okay. Now, now can you can you hear me now? Can you hear me now, Natalie? You can hear me, right? I can't hear you. Yeah, you need to adjust something. I don't know what. But it shows your microphone's on and your camera's on. I don't think it's me. Let me check here. Sometimes it is me. No. No, my, my sound's coming through. It's... Maybe reboot your, you're using a smartphone, right? Try to reboot, okay? Reboot. Maybe reboot, you're using a Uh, Natalie, reboot, okay? Because I can't hear you.
Okay, Natalie, can you hear can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Jim, I can hear you. <laughs> okay, me. okay. Now you're on your laptop. Yeah, I prefer the laptop. The phone is disturbing. Okay. Yes, Jim, I can hear Okay, you. okay. Now you're on your laptop. Yeah, I prefer the laptop. The phone is disturbing. Okay. How you been? I've oh, been good and you John. Good. Good, exciting, uh, man. We'll make we'll make it Zolo work. <laughs> yeah. That um, poor, that poor kid just did an hour presentation last week. Uh, yeah, <laughs> now yeah, he's I yeah. Uh, and now he's doing another one. Yeah. I, I admire his work ethic. That's great. Okay, let me do some last minute stuff. Okay. I'll be back. Hey, Dr. Kabulo. Yes, Dr. Bennett, how are you? Good, how you been? I'm okay. Boy, we're making Zolo work hard. Sorry? We're making Zolo work very hard. Yes. He, wow. he, he's presenting <laughs> again today. Yes, he's presenting again. <laughs> that is amazing. In medical school, man, yes. oh man, yes. for me to do an hour presentation, forget it. Sure, we we want to make sure that we cook him properly. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, man. Oh man, how you doing, Zolo? We're talking about you. Hello, hello, hello doctor. Hello, doctor Bennett. Hello, doctor Kabulu. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're making you work very hard. 
Yeah, you yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Good. That's great. That's great. So uh, hopefully the internet connection will be okay. Uh, but we'll continue if it stops. And and you know how to maximize it, right? You, you turn off the video, right, uh, Zolo? I, I did not get to Dr. Joe. I'm sorry. Yeah, can yeah. you repeat? After I introduce you, you can get off the photo, you know, get off the video. Okay? All right. Yes. Okay. We'll be starting in a few, about five minutes, okay? All right. Now, Dr. Gabulo's here. How you been, Dr. Gabulo? I'm okay, Dr. Bennett. That's good. You know, I really want to come to Nairobi uh, next year. Oh, okay. For that conference? Well, uh, you're going up there, right? To the conference, I think, next March or something? In March or okay. May? Because there's, there's one in uh, in December in Nairobi. Oh, it's in, it's December. What what part of December? This year. 20, oh, really? 20, yeah, I think December. Let me let me double check. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll be back in a minute. From, it's from 19 to 20. Okay. Please stay. Hello, Dr. Kabulo. Hi, Dr. Natalie. How are you? I'm fine in you. Good, good. Long time. Yeah, I was very busy with uh, i talked to you about ascovi what we do during the weekends yes you always go to rural area yeah so i was busy with it That's yeah we had missed you a lot on the panel yeah thank you zoro hi hello dr uh, uh, natalie how are you i'm finding you I, i'm great and i'm happy having you around oh me too i heard you are doing you're kicking it since last week <laughs> My best. <laughs> I have the I have the right mentor, so I'm doing my best. You have what? I didn't get you. I say I have the right mentors. I have the right mentors. So I'm telling you, there are much of them in the panel now. We are so we are so blessed. Yeah. <laughs> didn't know that you reached this level. Okay. Big men like Dr. Kabulo, Dr. Nuru, yeah, yeah, Dr. Yeah. Khalif. It's just like yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, are you having you're having two presentations? That's all today. Yes, yes, I have two presentations. I hope you're going to be able to wrap it on. Uh, I have a uh, uh, traumatic brain injury management and uh, acute hydrocephalus. Okay. Uh, they were not programmed differently. I don't. I don't remember what our no, schedule. Actually, was. actually, for today, uh, uh, it was mainly uh, acute hydrocephalus, but uh, by the yes, the master decided to add uh, management of traumatic brain injury from uh, uh, last week's presentation. Oh, okay, great. Yes, so, great, yeah, great, great. Yeah. Dr. Gabulo, your background is working pretty good. Yeah, it is. It is working now. <laughs> uh, not bad. Not bad. Yeah, uh, we'll get. Uh, it seems like you have a black shirt. I, I when I have a black background, it seems to be better. You know what I mean? I think. I okay. think if I. I think if I. Well, do what you want to do, but maybe in the future, make it. Uh, want me to try a black background? Yeah, try it. You can experiment. You know, you just play okay. with it and uh, and. Uh, it's okay. Let me try. Yeah. Because I don't know how to fix, you know, you see your shoulders, you are kind of like not like, yeah, that's, you see how better it is there? You, you try different, that's better. Yeah, that's, I don't know what you did, but it's better. What'd you do? Okay. I tried to change the picture. Yeah, yeah it, Let looks, me just, uh, it looks better. It looks better. And now it looks very good. You see it, What you see it, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it looks looks better. I don't know what you did, but 
Yeah, around my head too, there's come, I know if we had a green screen, it would take it away, but but I think they're gonna improve this gradually. So anyway, did you find out the dates of that Nairobi one in December? It's 19 to 22nd December. Okay, I think there's another one in Nairobi. I think there's that, another that, one. That, that Khalid talks about. And I think it's later, like in March or April or, uh, I, may, I could be mistaken. But It's in uh, August. I think so. I think he's talking August, about the cans, the cans to that 2020. Yeah, the big one. Did Did you hear Dr. Khalid talk about that in, in Nairobi? I think it was March or April or May. I'm not sure. It's August. But August, okay. That's the one, okay. I'm going to Spain in, in uh, January again. I, I love Spain, but the... Um, we're televising a neurointerventional radiology conference, and I'm going there uh, to be there. Yuha is going to be there. So you'll be in Spain in in January. Yeah, I'm definitely going to uh, Spain in Jan January 11th and 12th. Okay. So uh, you'll be we'll be televising. Yuha will be there. Did you meet Yuha in China? China? No, I didn't go in China at the... Oh, I'm sorry. You didn't go. Okay. Visa. Oh, yeah. okay. Like, you know what? A lot, of, a lot of people... Visa. Yeah, Dr. Kabulo, a lot of people had the same problem. Yeah. But I know I did because I tried to get a hold of them and say, you know, you have to give me a letter of introduction or something because at the customs, if you just say, yeah, I'm going to a conference, they're going to say, what conference? <laughs> Show us the documentation, and, and and I couldn't get any from them. Do, do you know what I mean? Yes. Like a confirmation or something like that, or something, mm -hmm. a letter. Okay. So, anyways, um, anyways, um, so yeah, if you guys have tried to use the app, the app is not working too good. We're gonna, I've got another developer working on it now that I think is more experienced. You know, I, I tell you, it's such a pain in the neck, the app, <laughs> but it's going to be worth it if we get it to work well. Hello, Dr. Doc Panu. Doc Panu, can you, can you hear me okay? Very, very well. Oh, good, good. Hi, is your camera working or you don't have the bandwidth? But I, I'm just surprised. I don't know what's happening, but the camera is not working. I can't see my. I can't see uh, myself anyway. Yeah. Okay. Well, try to just at the uh, yeah, using a laptop or a desktop. On the laptop, I, the the camera is not working, so I, I on my phone to to, to Oh, watch okay. To, to okay. That's video. that. That's fine. How are you doing today? I'm fine, sir. I, I'm I actually. I, I come back to Benin. Uh, I'm. I, I got. I got so, some some weeks of holiday. Oh, very good. Welcome. You're welcome to any of our webcasts. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank and you, not, sir. not only Africa, but the rest of the world. Because yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah. Because we're going to continue to do this with superstars like Yo Zolo. We try to work to we work him to death. But I hope he survives. But, but yes, uh, we, we we will have others from other countries. Okay, Zolo. Okay, sir. Uh, let me get to, hold on. Let me let me get ready to get started here. Okay, look at this. Okay.
Okay, ready to start, Zolo? Yes, Dr. Oh, Bennett. Okay, let me give you a, a, a countdown first. Put the record button on. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good afternoon. This is Dr. John Bennett from Neurosurgical TV headquarters in Miami Beach. We have the pleasure of having another uh, Association of Future Neurosurgeons of Africa presentation with Zolo Yvan, a medical student who works hard. We had him work last week doing an hour presentation, or actually two hours. Uh, today, he's going to be discussing brain injury and acute hydrocephalus. And we're graced by the presence of Dr. Kabulo. Hi, Dr. Kabulo. Hi, Dr. Bennett. Could you please introduce yourself? Thank you. My name is Kabulo from Democratic Republic of Congo. Currently, I'm final year neurosurgery resident at the University of Zimbabwe. He's one of the main mentors of this channel. Natalie, welcome. Go ahead, unmute there, Natalie. Okay, go ahead. Oop, hold on. I am. Uh, yeah, okay, we can hear you now. Hello, I'm Natalie Christine Gomsi. I'm a general practitioner and member of Future of Neurosurgeons. Very good. Welcome, Natalie. And Dr. Doc Panu. Uh, welcome. Your camera's not working, could you, but could you please introduce yourself, <laughs> tell where you're from, etc. Yes, sir. Um, I'm Dr. Dupon Christian. I'm from Benin Republic. Neosurgical resident uh, of the WFNS of Morocco. Oh, welcome. Uh, an associate of Dr. Nuru. Actually, actually, I'm back to my country. I'm on holiday. Okay, welcome. Welcome anytime. Okay, Zolo, uh, thank you for pre preparing this and welcome, and it's all yours. Hey, hello, Dr. Bennett. Hello to all the panelists. It's a pleasure being here. I am Zolo Ivan. I am a, a CTA medical student from the University of Boya in Cameroon. Thank you. So uh, I think I'll just move directly to the presentation. So I'll be presenting from my phone. <laughs> my smartphone. Excellent. So, uh, yeah. so let me share my screen. Okay. Yeah. We can see you're orienting the screen now. <laughs> All right. Set it. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, the presentation is uh, management of traumatic brain injury and is given uh, by me, Zulu Ivan, a member of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons, a medical student from the Faculty of Health Science University of Boya. So let's start. We are going to follow uh, this plan. We are going to have an introduction, uh, give a, uh, an, an, an idea about the epidemiology, the pathology, the management, the, the, the prognosis, the prevention. Uh, and uh, you are going to see head injury in children. Then you are going to speak about some complications and uh, you are going to conclude and I'll give you my references. So uh, the silent epidemic of uh, modern time, which is also traumatic brain injury, is uh, defined as damage to the brain resulting from external mechanical force, uh, such as rapid acceleration or deceleration, impact, blast waves or penetration by a projectile. Head injury is a, a damage to uh, other structures such as the scalp and skull. A traumatic brain injury is thus a subset of a head injury. And the traumatic brain injury can result in brain function being temporarily or permanently impaired. And also a structural damage uh, may, uh, may uh, uh, um, the structural damages caused by traumatic brain injury may not be detectable at the early stages in some cases. So the outcome can range from a uh, complete recovery to permanent disability and even death. And uh, in addition, uh, a variety of events uh, following the injury may result in further injury. So uh, these processes include alter al alterations in cerebral blood flow and uh, the pressure with, uh, and the alterations also in the pressure within the skull. So apart from the uh, history, uh, of, of the patient and physical examination. Some imaging techniques are used to, uh, for, for, the, for diagnosis, and this, image, uh, this imaging uh, includes uh, computed tomography and uh, 
magnetic resonance imaging of the head. The treatment, uh, the treatment required may be supportive or may include medications, emergency surgery or uh, surgery years after. So somebody having a traumatic brain injury, he might have some sequelae that might need some surgical interventions years after the, 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 the injury. And uh, some might even and some might need a re rehabilitation measures after uh, the management of these uh, traumatic brain injuries. So, because of its serious implications, prevention remains the key. And prevention measures include use of seat belts and helmets, avoid drinking and driving. Uh, all prevention efforts in older uh, adults, you know that uh, in patients who are older, one of the main causes of traumatic brain injury is fall. So, and also safety measures for children. Traumatic brain injury is an acquired brain injury. And first of uh, all, uh, uh, and first of all, together with non-traumatic brain injury. And thus, this uh, traumatic brain injury is a CNS injury and uh, a form of uh, neuro, um, neuro trauma. Sorry, I put the neuro transmission. It is actually neuro trauma. It's a, it's a typing error. So there are various classifications of traumatic brain injury using various criteria. And the, one of the classification is uh, based on the severity. Here we can classify it as being mild, moderate, and uh, severe. And here we use the Glasgow Coma Scale. We use the uh, uh, level, the, the loss of consciousness. We do also use post-traumatic amnesia. And uh, another uh, classification criteria is based on the anatomical features of the injury. We also have the mechanism of the injury and uh, the pathological features of the injury. All this helps us to orientate uh, the treatment given to the patient. So the GCS is uh, the most commonly used system for classifying traumatic brain injury severity. And uh, a GCS of uh, 13 or above is considered as mild, while a GCS between 9 to 12 is moderate, and uh, below an 8 or below it is considered as severe. Um, the GCS grading system has limited ability to predict outcomes. Thus, after uh, resuscitation, duration of post-traumatic amnesia and the loss of consciousness are also used to help us uh, orientate and to help us classify the severity of the traumatic brain injury. It has also been proposed to use uh, changes that are visible on neuroimaging. So they're using the different uh, uh, techniques that have been mentioned earlier, computer tomography and the uh, uh, MRI. And uh, some of these uh, changes that we can see are swelling, focal lesions, or diffuse injury, as, uh, and we use all this as a method of classifying uh, the, the severity of traumatic brain injury. The grading scale also exists to classify the severity of mild traumatic brain injury, commonly called uh, concussion. So another name for mild traumatic brain injury is concussion. And uh, these use the duration of the loss of consciousness, a post-traumatic amnesia, and other uh, concussion symptoms. So here we have a small table that helps us to have an idea of, of what I just said. So if you see here for mild, you see the GCS is between 13 to 15, and the post-traumatic amnesia is less than one day, while the loss of consciousness is between 0 to 30 minutes. While in moderate, we have a GCS of 9 to 12. Post-traumatic amnesia is uh, greater than 1 to uh, less than 7 days, while the loss of consciousness is greater than 30 minutes to uh, 24 hours. And, and then for severe, we have a GCS between uh, uh, 3 to 8, post-traumatic amnesia greater than seven days and the loss of consciousness of 24 hours. This is very important because you cannot only use one criteria to uh, classify a severity. It might give you some um, some wrong information, but when you, when you combine all these three, it helps you to have a better idea about the severity of your patient. So uh, for diffuse injury, they manifest with little apparent damage in neuroimaging. And uh, you can, it can be seen more on diffuse stem cell imaging which is a way of processing uh, MRI images. So focal injuries often produce symptoms related to the function of the damaged area. So depending on the part of the brain that is being affected, you are going to have a focal uh, manifestation of focal injuries. And then hematomas, which are focal uh, lesions, uh, we have intracerebral hemorrhage uh, with bleeding in the brain tissue itself. It's an intraaxial lesion. If you see, there was some classification of uh, brain injuries above. So this is where hematomas fall. They Intraaxial lesion. So extraaxial lesions include epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and intraventricular hemorrhage. So to have an idea about the epidemiology, about 1.7 million cases of traumatic brain injury occur in the US every year. So it's a bit difficult to have uh, uh, much information concerning Africa uh, due to the reasons we, we, we all know. So 
the, 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 the values we have, the better values we have are those from the United States. And uh, approximately 5.3 million people live with a disability caused by traumatic brain injury in the US alone. So you can have an idea about how traumatic brain injury is, 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 uh, 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 is important. And as we said earlier, it's, uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's a form of epidemic, actually. So uh, annual direct and indirect traumatic brain injury costs are estimated at uh, uh, 48 to 56 billion US dollars. And there are about 235,000 hospitalizations for traumatic brain injury every year, which is more than 20 times the number of, of, of hospitalizations for spinal cord injury. Among children ages 14 and uh, um, younger, traumatic brain injuries account for an estimated 2,685 deaths, while uh, 37,000 hospitalizations and the 437,000 emergency room visits. So uh, every year, 80,000 to 90,000 people experience the onset of uh, long-term or lifelong disability associated with traumatic brain injury. And uh, males represent 78% uh, 78 of all reported traumatic brain injury accidents, and females represent 21.2%. So the national statistics uh, estimate, estimate between 50 to 70 percent of traumatic brain injury accidents are a result of motor vehicle crash, and the sports are uh, sports and recreational activities contribute to about 21 percent of all traumatic brain injuries among American children and adolescents. The mortality rate for traumatic brain injury is 30 per 100,000, or an, uh, an estimated 50,000 deaths in the United States annually. Of those who die. 50%, 50% do not do so within uh, the first hour of the injury, which is which is also considered as the, uh, the, the the golden hour. So deaths from head injuries account for 34% of all traumatic uh, deaths. Beginning at the uh, age 30, the mortality risk after head injury begins to increase, and persons ages from uh, 60 and older have the highest death rate after traumatic brain injury, primarily because of falls, which have a rising incidence in, the, uh, in this age group. So with all this, you actually see that traumatic brain injury is a, a, a very important burden to the healthcare system. So that's why we are going to move directly to the pathology. So the initial stage after traumatic brain injury result from direct tissue damage and impaired auto-regulation auto of cerebral blood flow, along with a disordered metabolism. We saw this in the uh, last week's presentation. This uh, state, similar to ischemia, may lead to accumulation of lactic acid, increased cell membrane permeability, and subsequent edema. Since anaerobic metabolism uh, uh, cannot sustain the demands of the brain, adenosine triphosphate stores are depleted, which ultimately results in failure of the ATP-dependent membrane ionic pumps, which are essential for maintaining adequate homeostasis. This is what Dr. Ulrich spoke about uh, last week in last week's presentation. So the second stage of uh, this cascade is characterized by sustained membrane depolarization along with uh, excitotoxicity and uh, the activation of voltage-dependent calcium ion and sodium ion channels. The subsequent calcium and the sodium uh, uh, influx results in the activation of, light, uh, of lipid peroxidase, proteases, and the phospholipid, I mean phospholipases. Uh, which trigger the apoptotic cascade and ultimately lead to the membrane degradation and cell death. So uh, extracerebral organ dysfunction may be triggered and uh, promoted by, uh, systemic inflammatory, uh, by systemic inflammation following traumatic brain injury. And uh, it has been suggested that the catecholamine surge following traumatic, uh, traumatic brain injury is directly involved in upregulation of cytokine levels and may contribute to systemic organ dysfunction. Endocrine, respiratory, and uh, cardiac dysfunction are common, while renal and hepatic uh, manifestations are unusual. The most important of these organ dysfunction in, uh, uh, in the acute setting is neurogenic pulmonary edema, which is also abbreviated NPE. And uh, this neurogenic pulmonary edema can develop immediately or during the uh, 14 days following traumatic brain injury. So after traumatic brain injury, don't believe that maybe because your patient seems to be good, uh, the, 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 the patient is uh, 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 out of danger. So it leads to, uh, this, um, this leads to increased extra, uh, uh, extravascular fluid in the lungs that cause hypoxia and decreased compliance. The vascular tone of the pulmonary vessel is thought to increase as a consequence of catecholamine storm, 
that occurs after traumatic brain injury and results in increase in travascular pressure and hydrostatic edema. So, in other in other words, uh, large percentages of people killed by brain trauma do not die right away, and they rather days to weeks after the event. Um, Rather than improving uh, after being hospitalized, after being hospitalized, some 40 percent of traumatic brain injury patients deteriorate, and primary brain injury is not uh, uh, adequate to explain this deterioration. Rather, it is caused by secondary uh, injury, a complex, uh, which is a complex set of cellular processes and biochemical uh, cascades that occur in minutes to days following the the, 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 the traumatic brain injury. So these secondary uh, processes can dramatically worsen the, da the damage caused by primary injury and accounts for the greatest number of uh, traumatic brain injury deaths. And uh, uh, these include damage to the blood brain barrier, release of factors that cause inflammation, free radical overload, excess, uh, excessive release of the neurotransmitter glutamate, uh, influx of calcium and sodium ions into neurons, and the uh, dysfunction of the mitochondria. Also, other factors include uh, changes in the blood flow to the brain, ischemia, cerebral hypoxia, cerebral edema, and raised intracranial pressure. So intracranial pressure uh, may rise due to swell or uh, mass effect from a lesion such as hemorrhage, and as we saw uh, uh, last week. As a result, cerebral perfusion pressure is reduced, and ischemia results. When the pressure within the skull rises too high, it can cause uh, uh, brain death or herniation in which parts of the brain are squeezed by structures in the skull. We saw, this, uh, uh, we saw all this mechanism last week. Thus, part of the management involves reducing and controlling this intracranial pressure. The type, the type, direction, intensity, and duration of forces all contribute to the uh, characteristics or the severity of traumatic brain injury. And forces that may contribute to traumatic brain injury include angular, rotational shear, and translational uh, forces. Even in the absence of an impact, a significant acceleration or, dis or, or deceleration of the head can cause traumatic brain injury. So uh, in most cases, a combination of impact and acceleration is the cause. And the forces uh, involving the head striking or uh, being struck by something, them, uh, contact or uh, impact loading are the cause of, of most focal injuries and movement of the brain within this called term uh, non-contact or inertial loading usually causes the, the uh, diffuse injuries. So the violent shaking of an infant can also, uh, can, uh, I mean, that causes uh, shaken baby syndrome, uh, commonly manifest as diffuse uh, uh, injury. In impact loading, the forces sends, uh, the forces, the, the force sends shock waves through the skull and the brain resulting in tissue damage. Shock waves caused by the uh, penetrating injuries can also destroy tissue along the path the projector. So damage may occur directly under the site of impact or it may uh, occur on the site opposite the impact, that is coup and contra coup injuries. And uh, uh, this is when a moving object impacts the, uh, the, the, the stationary head, which is termed as coup injuries. And uh, while contra coup injuries are uh, usually uh, uh, produced when the moving head strikes a, a, a stationary object. So uh, the clinical picture, to help you make a diagnosis, the clinical picture of a patient having traumatic brain injury depends on the type of traumatic brain injury that is diffuse or focal. And the severity and the part of the brain that is affected also helps in determining this, uh, 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 this clinical picture. And uh, some of the uh, clinical manifestations include vomiting, lethargy, headache, confusion, paralysis, uh, coma, loss of consciousness, directed pupil, vision changes. And uh, with, uh, others are cerebrospinal fluid uh, 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 coming out of the ears or the nose. So we have uh, CSF uh, uh, anuria and CSF otorrhea. We have dizziness and balance problems. We have uh, breathing problems. We have slow pulse. We have slow breathing rate with, with an increase in the pulse, uh, in the blood pressure. Uh, this, I think, uh, falls uh, inside the uh, caution triad. And the uh, ringing in the ears or changes in hearing, cognitive difficulties, inappropriate emotional responses. We have speech difficulties. We have difficult swallowing. We have body numbness or tingling. We also have uh, uh, a droopy uh, eyelid or facial weakness. Then we also have a loss of bowel control or bladder uh, control. So the diagnosis is made by uh, having a good history of the, the, the patient when you can. 
you should not just always wait for the for the history because some patient can actually be in a coma and you might not have somebody who was the witness of the uh, of the, uh, the, the 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 trauma if you put it like that so you, you you must take a good history when possible you must do a good physical examination and uh, you, you also need a uh, neuro imaging and this neuro imaging some of these neuro imaging that you need are completed uh, tomography we have magnetic resonance imaging we have angiography. Uh, sometimes we can even use X-ray of the head. Uh, we have an uh, 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 electroencephalography. We have transcranial Doppler. And uh, neuropsychological assessment is important for long-term management and rehabilitation. So we should not neglect this aspect uh, in the management. So seen, having seen all this, uh, so how now do you manage a patient who has a traumatic brain injury? So, Traumatic brain injury management must follow the ETLS protocol. Eventually, the, a patient with having a traumatic brain injury is a, 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 is, is a case of trauma. So you must follow the ETLS protocol. We all know the, 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 the different segments. And uh, um, you must begin emergency treatment within the golden hour following the injury. That is a must if you, if you want to have a better outcome. So moderate uh, to severe injuries are likely to uh, receive treatment in an intensive care unit Followed by a neurosurgical, uh, uh, I mean, followed by a neurosurgical ward. So after managing the emergency, you send the patient in the neurosurgical ward for, I would say, follow up and uh, uh, continuous management. So the management depends on the recovery stage of the patient, and uh, in uh, the acute stage, the aim is to stabilize the patient and focus on prevent on preventing further injury. While rehabilitation is the main uh, treatment for the subacute and the chronic stages of uh, recovery. So. Uh, in the acute stage, what you need to do is uh, you care, uh, uh, the care of a traumatic brain injury should begin at the side of the injury with an aim to secure the patient's airway and uh, maintain adequate ventilation and circulation. So initial measures include uh, transporting patients to an appropriate care delivery center that is where uh, that is available. Um, during transport and in the hospital, the primary concern are ensuring proper oxygenation. So, I mean, Installing proper oxygenation, maintaining adequate uh, blood flow to the brain, and the controlling race intracranial pressure. These are a mandatory uh, aspects to take care of when you are, you, are, you are managing a patient in the acute stage. So the outcomes in traumatic brain injury patients have been found to be influenced by the transportation method, the duration of transit, and whether the respond, uh, responding team is led by a physician or a paramedic. So... The primary management goals are the prevention of hypoxia and hypotension because even a single episode of hypotension has been found to be associated with the doubling of mortality and an elevated risk of uh, morbidity. So secondary brain injury uh, 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 prevention is the primary concern of therapeutic interventions following traumatic brain injury, which can, uh, which can best be managed by an anesthesiologist and preferably a neuroanesthesiologist that is preferably. And uh, uh, so let us now look at the different uh, uh, the different uh, sections or the, the, diff yeah, the different sections in the management of a traumatic brain injury patient. So we, let us take the airway uh, control and ventilation. Although airway control may be our primary concern in these patients, studies have, have reported poorer outcomes for traumatic brain injuries, uh, traumatic brain injury patients who were intubated at the site of trauma. Intubation by uh, inexperienced providers showed a fourfold increase in the death and a significant higher, right, higher risk of worse functional outcome when compared to patients whose airway uh, uh, was secured in the emergency department. Thus, so, uh, so, uh, thus it suggested that basic airway care uh, performed well in a uh, pre hospital setting may be significant better than a, a pre hospital intubation that is performed poorly. So it's always better, it will be better to do the, 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 the basic uh, um, airway uh, uh, um, the basic airway management than, than to intubate a patient when you are not in the appropriate setting. So um, patients with traumatic brain injury have up to 5% to 6% incidence of an unstable cervical spine injury. Therefore, all attempts at intubation should include, should, I mean, should include in light neck stabilization to reduce the chance of a uh, worsening a neurological injury until radiological clearance is obtained. And the pre-existing hypoxia, intracranial hypertension, full stomach, and uh, coexisting injuries such as cervical spine trauma and the maxillofacial injuries may be present that predisposes the patient to difficult airway management. Thus, 
careful uh, uh, preparation and pre-oxygenation is mandatory. So, uh, uh, anesthetic drugs that allow for rapid control of the airway while avoiding an increase in the intravenous pressure and providing hemodynamic stability are preferred. Uh, Propofol and the etiopental are the most commonly used drugs, but they may cause uh, hypotension. So, it's very important to take note of this statement. So, etomidate uh, 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 has, has advantages in terms of cardiovascular stability. But uh, the, uh, the possibility of adrenal suppression exists. So ketamine is the popular. I mean, so ketamine is popular in a trauma patient, and the recent evidence suggests that uh, I mean its effect on the intracranial pressure may be limited. So trauma, trauma is always better, it's better to use ketamine. And uh, for rapid sequence intubation, succinylcholine uh, and uh, or rupuronium uh, 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 used. Although succinyl choline may uh, produce a small increase in intracranial pressure, this has to date. I mean, this has to date. No proven, uh, uh, not been proven to be clinically significant. And uh, to maintain a response of uh, to uh, laryngoscopy, an opiate such as fentanyl uh, may be used, but there is no evidence to support the use of lidocaine. Adequate sedation and uh, muscular relaxation tend to reduce the cerebral. Uh, metabolic oxygen, oxygen requirement and to optimize uh, ventilation and prevent uh, coughing or, 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 or screening. So, still on the airway control and ventilation, ventilation of patients with a severe traumatic brain injury aims to maintain the PCO2 within a normal range of 34 to 38 uh, millimeters of mercury. Hyperventilation should be avoided as uh, increased uh, PCO2 levels may lead cerebral uh, hyperemia with an increase in blood volume and the intracranial pressure. We saw it in the last presentation. And the uh, hyperventilation, on the uh, other hand, results in an increased risk of vasoconstriction and increased tissue hy uh, hypoxia, especially in the, the penumbra zone, so it is best avoided. Traction of uh, inspired oxygen setting on a ventilator should be adjusted to achieve a PA O2 of uh, nine of approximately 90 uh, millimeter of mercury, which can uh, oxy oxygenate the penumbra zone, and the high PaO2 should be avoided. Just consi uh, considering the risk of uh, 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 hyperoxic cerebral vasoconstriction and the uh, hyperoxic lung injury, uh, we also saw part of this in the last presentation. So the positive end expiratory uh, uh, the, uh, the positive end expiratory pressure. Is a pressure which is applied by the ventilator, which is the pressure which is applied by the ventilator at the end of each breath to prevent atelectasis, uh, uh, should be maintained between five to ten, uh, uh, five to ten centimeter of water, and uh, this uh, uh, may be administered to prevent atelectasis, as, 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 as already said, and has been proven to be uh, safe in these patients. So, uh, in inhalation of uh, beta two. Agonists may induce transient vasodilation with an increase in the intracranial pressure and a reduction in the blood pressure. If this occurs, the dose should be uh, halved for subsequent inhalation therapy. And evidence from uh, recent trials indicate that although early tracheostomy may not be associated with the reduction in the ventilatory associated pneumonia, uh, ventilatory, uh, 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 ventilatory or intensive care unit days are reduced. So, consequently, the, the, the brain trauma foundation has recommended that early tracheostomy should be performed to reduce ventilation days when the overall benefit of uh, when the overall benefit outweighs the, 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 the complication associated with the procedure. And this is a level two study. So, uh, having seen how to manage the airway and the, and the ventilation aspect, let us now see uh, uh, have, a, have an idea about the blood pressure and the cerebral percussion pressure. So. Despite consensus on the, the principles of early management, there is no widespread agreement on resuscitation goals as various expert bodies have offered, have offered different management guidelines. Initially, the recommendation was to keep the, the cerebral perfusion pressure above 70 millimeters of mercury uh, with vasopressors if needed. But uh, these, uh, uh, the subsequent studies showed that outcomes were better with the relatively lower cerebral perfusion pressure possibly because of the reduced incidence of acute respiratory distress syndrome, secondary to reduced vasopressor usage, which is uh, very important to note. And uh, the fourth edition of the, uh, uh, 
Brain Tumor Foundation guidelines recommend maintaining the, the, the solid blood pressure at the greater than or equal to 100 mm of mercury for patients 50 to 69 years old or at the greater than or equal to 110 mm of mercury or above for patients 15 to 49 or over 70 years old to decrease mortality and, pre and, pre and improve outcome. And this is a level three uh, 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 study. So they, recommend, they recommended a uh, target uh, cerebral perfusion pressure value for, so for survival and the favorable outcome is between 60 and the 70 mm of mercury. Whether 60 or 70 mm of mercury is the minimum, uh, I mean, whether 60 to 70 mm of mercury is the minimum optimal cerebral perfusion pressure threshold is unclear and they may uh, depend upon the patient autoregulatory status and this is a level two uh, uh, study. So avoiding aggressive attempts to, uh, attempts to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure above 70 mm of mercury with fluids and pressures may be considered. So let us see, have an idea about the fluid management traumatic brain injury patient. So in a uh, um, hypotensive traumatic brain injury patient, hypovolemia resulting from extracranial hemorrhage should be first ruled out. Even in the absence of extracranial hemorrhage, hypovolemia can still develop by trans, uh, uh, transcapillary leakage. Although it may be difficult to estimate the extent of the hypovolemia, it can be roughly estimated uh, using standard methods such as, an, uh, such as analysis of the arterial uh, pulse pressure, variation, blood pressure response uh, following a, a free challenge or a passive leg raise. So crystalloids are usually for uh, uh, volume expanders. That is uh, 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 70 to 80 percent reaches the interstitial space within 20 minutes of infusion, contributing to general systemic tissue edema. With a disrupted blood brain barrier, significant uh, passive uh, 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 I mean, significant passive distribution into the brain interstitial may occur, leading to increased brain edema and increased intracranial pressure. Uh, especially if uh, hypotonic solutions are used. So saline is the most common crystalloid used in traumatic brain injury, but ringer lactate is also an alternative to it's, uh, 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 it's not really uh, uh, recommended in particular. So uh, infusions of large volumes of uh, normal saline results in the adverse hyper, uh, uh, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, that is detrimental in traumatic brain injury. And balanced crystalloid solution may be a, a, a good alternative. So colors appear to provide uh, no further benefit, and the safe trial found uh, increased mortality in patients receiving albumin compared to saline. And the traumatic brain injury is associated with the acute uh, uh, kidney injury in many patients, and they often present with co uh, consecutive higher mortality. So colors are also also found to be associated with the Increased changes, I mean, chances of uh, acute kidney injury and increased use of renal replacement therapy in critically in patients. Sorry, it's not so here. So, still under food management, rec uh, uh, recent uh, uh, cochrane reviews have demonstrated that the use of colloids is not superior to crystalloids for uh, um, overall mortality, especially in patients with uh, trauma, burns, or post surgery. So, however, administration uh, in the setting of uh, intact renal function may be considered. Evidence seems to suggest that it is the volume of fluid infused rather than the uh, choice of fluid itself that, uh, that plays an important role in the outcome uh, uh, following traumatic brain injury. Very important to also know. So having seen that, let us now have an idea about this uh, sedation and the analgesia for a patient with traumatic brain injury. So reducing stress and the uh, Adenocortica response is an important component of traumatic brain injury management. Even unconscious uh, traumatic brain injury patients may have increased blood pressure and increased intracranial, uh, I mean, and the intracranial pressure resulting from the uh, uh, these uh, stress responses. So, sedative agents can uh, reduce metabolic stress on acutely injured uh, brain tissue by decreasing cerebral metabolism and the consumption of oxygen in a dose dependent manner. That is uh, that in turn uh, decreases the, 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 the cerebral blood flow and leads to a reduction in the intracranial pressure. So care should be taken to maintain an adequate mean arterial pressure throughout the duration of sedation. So uh, achieving an uh, adequate level of sedation is paramount because it 
minimizes the length of hospital of hospital stay, ventilatory days, incidence of uh, 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 delirium, and helps in early mobilization. And the latest uh, uh, brain trauma foundation recommendation regarding the use of sedatives and analgesics are as follows. So they, they are administration of barbiturates to uh, uh, induce burst suppression as prophylaxis against intracranial hypertension is not recommended is not recommended and this is level two study so high dose barbiturates are recommended to control intracranial pressure refractory to maximum standard surgical and uh, medical treatments while ensuring hemodynamic stability although propofol may be used for uh, intracranial pressure control it is not recommended for improvements uh, in mortality uh, 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 or six month outcome. So, how do you manage the, the, the I mean, how do you monitor intracranial pressure and how do you manage uh, it in patients with traumatic brain injury? Patients with elevated uh, intracranial pressure have been shown to have uh, worse outcomes and are at a higher risk of mortality. The indication of uh, intracranial pressure monitoring in traumatic brain injury from the latest edition of the BTF guidelines are as follows. So we have the management of, of severe traumatic brain injury patients based on intracranial pressure monitoring may reduce in hospital and, uh, and, and the uh, two-week post-injury may reduce in hospital and two-week post-injury mortality. Second one is the, uh, the, the guideline no longer include a recommendation regarding patients that should be chosen for monitoring because of the insufficiency, insufficient high-quality evidence. And also, clinical judgment should uh, be used to initiate intracranial monitoring in patients who are at uh, a high risk of uh, clinical deterioration. We saw this. We saw some of this aspect in last week's uh, presentation. So, updated BTF guidelines state that intracranial pressure monitoring is a level two recommendation and uh, recommend treatment of intracranial pressure greater than. 22 millimeter of mercury to reduce mortality. So the management of uh, intracranial pressure includes standardized strategies that use a staircase approach with an uh, escalating treatment intensity. And the American College, uh, while the American College of uh, uh, of Surgeons traumatic uh, uh, traumatic brain injury guidelines recommend a three a three tier uh, uh, approach for the uh, management of uh, increased intracranial pressure. So here we have a a, 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 a diagram which shows the staircase approach. So invasive monitoring using the external ventricular drain technique in which a, a, a catheter is placed into one of the ventricle through a borehole is considered to be the gold standard of intracranial pressure monitoring. Dr. Ulrich uh, said this uh, last week. So in addition to uh, measuring intracranial pressure, this technique can also be used to drain cerebrospinal fluid and uh, administer medicine inter intrathecally such as uh, for uh, antibiotic administration in cases of ventriculitis. And then additional, uh, additionally, uh, uh, um, external ventricular drain placement may be indicated to, uh, to drain post-traumatic hemorrhage. So let's have a, a look to this uh, diagram. So it's actually a flow chart and everything is being mentioned here. So let's move to uh, osmotherapy in the uh, management of traumatic brain so, osmotherapy with manitol has been used since the uh, 1960s as the main treatment uh, for raised intracranial pressure and remains a component of traumatic brain injury management guidelines. Hypertonic saline uh, has become an alternative during the last 20 years, but, contro but controversy remains uh, regarding which solution is the best agent and regarding the best method of administration. So, manitol increases the cerebral blood flow uh, by plasma expansion decreasing the blood viscosity via uh, deformed uh, erythrocytes and promoting osmotic diuresis. This is what uh, uh, Dr. Kabulo spoke about uh, last time, last week in the comment uh, section. So um, hypertonic saline promotes the flux of uh, water across the blood brain barrier and improve the blood flow by expanding the plasma volume. Also, he also spoke about this. And the action of intracranial pressure reduction from baseline was significantly higher in subjects treated with the hypertonic saline compared with those treated with manitol. So because of the limited evidence, the recommendation of the third edition of the BTF guidelines are as follows. Manitol 
the, in, the, in that dosage is effective for the control of elevated intracranial pressure while avoiding hypotension. And this is a level two uh, recommendation. So let us look at the multimodal uh, neuro, uh, neuro monitoring. So jugular venous oxygenation saturation can be uh, used uh, to estimate the balance between uh, global cerebral oxygen delivery and uptake. The catheter, and how do we do it? We uh, insert, uh, insert the catheter uh, into the dominal uh, internal jugular vein and they advance to the ju uh, jugular bulb, aiming to minimize the uh, contamination from extracranial venous uh, 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 return. So reduction in the jugular uh, uh, venous oxygen saturation levels below 55% indicates that cerebral oxygen demand may be inadequate to meet demand, usually due to a, 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 a decrease cerebral perfusion pressure or hyper uh, hyperventilation associated with the vasoconstriction. So, control, uh, controver co controversially increase uh, uh, increase indi indicates excessive perfusion caused by raised cerebral blood flow or decreased oxygen utilization secondary to cell death. Both reduction uh, of uh, uh, less than 50% and uh, greater than 75% after traumatic brain injury associated with the poor outcomes. And the monitoring uh, uh, following traumatic brain injury may lead to improved outcomes. So the uh, Lycox uh, monitor uses a close uh, polarographic uh, electrode to measure focal brain tissue oxygen, uh, oxygen tension. And the oxygen diffuses across the SME permeable membrane and produces a current uh, um, directly proportional to the oxygen concentration. And uh, the measure of uh, the PBRO2 represents the balance between oxygen delivery and uh, cellular oxygenation consumption. And also provides a highly focal analysis of the brain milieu and may be used to monitor the potentially salvageable penumbra following traumatic brain injury. And so the normal values are uh, uh, between uh, 35 to 50 millimeter of mercury. And following traumatic brain injury, reduced levels have been seen to be associated with the poorer outcomes. And cerebral microdialysis is being increasingly used as a bedside tool to provide analysis of brain uh, homeostasis in the intensive care setting. So um, Severe ischemia is usually associated with a significant increase in the lactate uh, pyruvate ratio, and it is associated with poor outcomes following traumatic brain injury. And cellular lysis following traumatic brain injury leads to degradation of membrane uh, phospholipids and release of uh, glycerol into extracellular fluid, making it as uh, making it a useful marker in this uh, setting. So cerebral micro uh, 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 cerebral micro concentration of glycerol are typically elevated in the first 24 hours after traumatic brain injury and followed by an exponential decline over the next three days. So subsequent increase in the glycerol are associated with poor uh, prognosis and seizures uh, and seizure activity on electro uh, 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 electroencephalography. And the post-traumatic seizure are a major cause of secondary brain injury following traumatic brain injury is very important to note and are associated with the higher injury severity and the, sorry, and the worse outcome. So recent data suggests that seizure occurring in up to 20% of patients with traumatic brain injury, I mean, a recent data suggests that seizure occurs in up to 20% of uh, patients uh, percent of patients with traumatic brain injury and these seizures are usually uh, uh, non-convulsive in nature and cannot be detected uh, clinically making a continuous EEG uh, uh, recording a vital tool in diagnosis and management. This Dr. Uh, Ulrich uh, mentioned it last week, so it's a very important point. So uh, the anti-convulsant uh, uh, therapy in the patient with traumatic brain injury is as follows. So subsequent uh, uh, Subsequent to traumatic brain injury, convulsive activity results in increased intracranial pressure and altered oxygen supply to the injured brain. So to prevent uh, a secondary brain injury, many studies have attempted to study the benefit of seizure prophylaxis. Treatment with phenytoin, sorry, treatment with phenytoin was uh, effective in uh, decreasing the rate of post-traumatic seizures in the first seven days of injury, but has 
but has no significant role in prevention of post traumatic seizure after the first week of injury. This, this point is also very important. So, clinical com uh, comparisons of uh, uh, the Sitam and Pinitoin is in, in prevention of early post traumatic seizure prophylaxis have found no significant difference in rates of early post traumatic seizures among patients treated with Pinitoin compared with patients treated with uh, uh, Lev. Lev Tiracetam, sorry for the sorry for the pronunciation. So the current the, the, the current brain trauma foundation guidelines recommend treatment with the anticonvulsants within seven days of injury. So no uh, randomized control studies have been performed in date to prove that uh, one anti-epileptic drug is better than another in this setting. So this is a good uh, uh, zone of study and research for uh, so temperature management in traumatic brain injury. In clinical uh, practice, even mild uh, hypothermia has been associated with poorer outcomes and longer ICU stays, as it is, I mean, as it is, I mean, as it may lead to increased edema and inflammation. So, excuse uh, me, Zolo. Excuse me. Yeah. Yes, uh, doctor. Yeah, could you try moving the mic a little closer to your mouth? I, uh, it's been suggested. Let's give that a try. All right, all right. Are you getting me better now? Yeah, that's good. That's better. Yes, actually, I'm holding it close to my mouth. Yeah, that's <laughs> very mouth. good. I'm sorry. I should have asked you sooner. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. So, okay. uh, conversely, uh, cooling uh, may be uh, neuroprotective and uh, uh, has been seen to improve outcomes following uh, uh, global brain hypoxia. So, however, the traumatized uh, brain suffers from compromised circulation and hypoxia in the penumbra zone, making it... Uh, uh, Hypersensitive to the adrenergic stress induced by the brain injury itself, which will uh, get aggravated uh, uh, with uh, uh, hypothermia. So, uh, some studies reported a significant increase in pulmonary complications in patients treated with the targeted temperature management compared with standard of care. This difference has been explained by the inhibition of fever uh, uh, to fight infection. Also, the uh, recommendation from the uh, uh, a brain trauma foundation is that early short-term prophylactic hypothermia is not recommended to improve outcomes and this is a level two a study so um, as far as glycemic control is, con is concerned after traumatic brain injury there is a marked catecholamine surge uh, with cortisol uh, release and glucose intolerance leading to significant hyperglycemia this is very, very important to note anaerobic metabolism of the glucose and the resulting acidosis in the brain may lead to neuronal dysfunction and the cerebral edema and the impaired cerebrovascular regulation following traumatic brain injury has also been implicated as a reason for poor outcome because of hyperglycemia and thus a glucose containing fluid should be avoided and blood sugar monitoring uh, 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 to maintain levels between 4 to 8 a minimal per liter. So, uh, for as far as the compressive craniotomy is concerned, uh, uh, craniotomy reduces intracranial pressure by giving extra space to the swollen brain and it may uh, quickly prevent brainstem herniation, which is one of the fear we have uh, when a patient have a trauma, it has a traumatic brain injury. So, uh, so uh, the, um, the decompressive craniotomy trial included patients who had refractory uh, increased intracranial pressures between 15 minutes and the one hour of onset, they, were, uh, they observed that there were significant uh, uh, fewer medical uh, uh, interventions to decrease intracranial pressure in patients treated with decompressive clinical. And uh, however, at the six months of follow-up, uh, functional outcome was worse in the decompressive pregnitomy group compared with the standard of care, standard of care group. So the, the randomized evaluation of surgery with pregnitomy for uncontrollable elevation of intracranial pressure trial compared secondary decompressive pregnitomy to optimal medical management. And at the six months, decompressive pregnitomy resulted in a lower mortality than a medical management, but higher rates of a vegetative state and disability. And the result of these trials confirmed that decompressive pregnitomy may be a life-saving surgery, but that uh, 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 its outcome, uh, uh, I mean, but that is 
it comes at the expense of higher chances of severe disability among survivors. So the latest uh, uh, BTF uh, uh, guidelines recommend a large frontotemporal front to parietal decompressive penectomy as opposed to a smaller one to uh, target reduced uh, mortality and better neurological outcome. And it's a level two uh, recommendation. As far as nutrition is involved, Early nutritional support is associated with better outcomes and the uh, enteral feeding has been found to be beneficial. So, a BTF recommends a basal, uh, basal caloric replacement by at least the fifth day and at the most by the seventh day post injury. And the uh, uh, transgastric jejunal feeding may also be, uh, I mean, they also reduce the risk of uh, ventilation associated with. So patients with a severe traumatic brain injury have gastric feeding intolerance, which may be attributed to dysfunctional gastric emptying secondary to increase intracranial pressure and uh, the use of opiates. And the prokinetic agents such as a meto, uh, a meto uh, chlorpramide may improve feeding uh, uh, tolerance. And the BTF recommends the replacement of 140% and the 100% of resting metabolic expenditure in non-paralyzed and paralyzed patients, respectively. However, a, a lower caloric intake may also be beneficial. So uh, as far as antibiotic therapy is concerned, since traumatic brain injuries are more likely to uh, receive invasive monitoring and uh, 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 I mean, invasive monitoring and the therapeutic treatments, including mechanical ventilation, they are also more likely to be uh, to, to be an increased risk for a uh, developing of infections. Sources of uh, potential infections need to be identified and appropriately and uh, an appropriate therapy should be instituted. So a common source of infection is invasive uh, uh, monitoring of intracranial pressure and the incidence of, uh, of uh, intracranial pressure device infection has been reported to range from 1% to 27%, which is actually somehow high. And the most studies cited uh, uh, by the BTF uh, guidelines have evaluated uh, uh, prophylactic antibiotic coverage in patients with traumatic brain injury have shown little significant difference in, in the infection rate. And uh, another study has evaluated patients uh, who receive uh, 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 bacitracin flushes uh, uh, and uh, showed a higher rate of infection among the intervention group. So the current guidelines suggest that use of antibiotic impregnated catheters uh, uh, to reduce uh, infection rate. And um, although this is only a level three recommendation, there is limited available data to support the use of antibiotic prophylaxis in traumatic brain injury. And uh, especially as the uh, data uh, suggests that such therapy may predispose this patient to more severe infections. And uh, we all know the, 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 the third world order is coming, that is uh, the war against uh, 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 bacteria resistant uh, 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 bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. But however, evidence for antibiotic therapy following penetrating traumatic brain injury is reduced and the therapy should be maintained for at least 7 to 14 days. So to for other uh, consideration, patients with traumatic brain injury are significant, I mean, are at significant risk of experiencing thromboembolic events. So options for prevention include mechanical uh, 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 mechanical, pharmacological, prophylaxis, or a combination of both. And pharmacological uh, uh, thromboprophylaxis uh, is usually initiated 48 to 72 hours after neurosurgical intervention and in the absence of other contraindication. Very important to look for the contraindication. So additional care includes a peptic ulcer prophylaxis, physiotherapy, and full uh, uh, hygienic care. The importance of both uh, high quality uh, perioperative intensive care and rehabilitation therapy in this patient cannot be overstated. And the uh, 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 proper uh, physiotherapy and the post-discharge care in this patient population has been found to be an independent predictor of mortality and mobility as reported by some studies. So in the, the chronic uh, stage, the management of the chronic stage, once a, a medically stable pupil, may, uh, I mean the, 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 the patient, may be transferred to a, a, a subacute rehabilitation unit of the a medical center or to an independent rehab, rehabilitation uh, uh, hospital. And the rehabilitation aims, rehabilitation aims to improve independent functioning at home and in society and to help 
adapt to disabilities. So rehabilitation has uh, demonstrated its uh, general effectiveness when co uh, conducted by a team of health professionals who specialize in the head trauma. And I think it's very important to have such professionals in Africa. And uh, as for any uh, person with a neurologic deficit, a multidisciplinary approach is the key to optimize outcome. So um, neurologists are likely to be uh, uh, the key medical staff involved, but depending on the person, uh, uh, depending on the person, doctors of other medical specialty may also be helpful. And uh, other health professionals, such as a physiotherapist, a physiotherapy, speech and language therapy, cognitive rehabilitation therapy, and the occupational therapy will be essential to assess, function, and design the rehabilitation activities for each person because this is a, a, an, indi an individualized care given to the patient. So the treatment of a neuropsychiatry, which is very important, should not be neglected. Symptoms uh, such as emotional distress and a clinical depression may involve mental health professionals such as therapists, psychologists and the uh, psychiatrists, while neuropsych uh, neuropsychologists can help to evaluate and manage cognitive uh, deficits. After discharge from uh, inpatient rehabilitation treatment unit, care may be uh, given uh, uh, on an outpatient basis. And the community-based uh, rehabilitation will be required for a high proportion of people, including vacation rehabilitation uh, 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 and the supportive employment matches job. So uh, let us look at the, uh, uh, the prognosis. Sorry. So let us have an idea about the prognosis of the patient. So the prognosis worsens with the severity of the injury. Most traumatic brain injuries uh, are mild and do not cause permanent or long-term disability. However, all severity levels of traumatic brain injury have the potential to cause significant long-lasting disability. So don't just uh, uh, rely on the, the severity. Maybe saying that because the patient has a mild traumatic brain injury, the prognosis might be better. Yes, yeah, somehow better, but it still has the ability to move and to be catastrophic. So, permanent disability is uh, thought to occur in 10% of mild injuries and, six, uh, and 66 percent of moderate injuries and 100 percent of severe injury. So, most mild traumatic brain injury is uh, completely uh, resolved within three weeks. And the uh, old most all people with a mild traumatic brain injury are able to live independently and return to the jobs they had before the injury. All those a small portion have mild cognitive and social impairments. So uh, over 90% of people with a uh, um, moderate traumatic brain injury are able to live independently, although some require assistance in areas such as physical uh, 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 abilities. Most people with severe close head injury either die or recover enough to live independently middle ground uh, in, uh, uh, and the middle ground is uh, less common. So coma, as it is closely uh, related to severity, is a strong predictor of the poor outcome in patients with traumatic brain injury. And pregnancy differs depending on the severity and location of the lesion and access to immediate specialized acute management. So uh, subdural hematoma is associated with the worst outcome and increased mortality, while people with epidural hematoma are expected to have a good outcome if they receive a surgery treatment. But you should not uh, 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 base yourself on uh, this, uh, um, this uh, uh, statement because, as I told you, any patient has the, uh, the, 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 the possibility of moving to a, a, a severe a severity and to become more severe. So, the acute abdominal injury may be associated with the coma when severe and uh, it has a poor outcome. Following the acute stage, prognosis is strongly influenced by the patient's involvement in activities that promote recovery, uh, in which for uh, most patients require, uh, require access to a specialized uh, intensive rehabilitation center. And the medical uh, uh, um, complications associated with the bad prognosis. So patients' characteristics also like comorbidities also influence the uh, prognosis of the patient. And the life satisfaction has been known to decrease for individuals with traumatic brain injury immediately following the trauma but evidence has shown that life holds age, I mean, life holds age and the depressive symptoms influence the, the trajectory of the life satisfaction as time passes. So how do you prevent traumatic brain injuries? Seeing how uh, 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 dangerous uh, these injuries are. So most traumatic brain injuries are vehicle accidents. Their prevention or the amelioration of their consequences can both reduce the incidence 
accidents and the gravity of a traumatic brain injury. In accidents, damage can uh, be uh, reduced by use of seat belts. So, um, child safety uh, child safety seats and motorcycle helmets and uh, they prevent the, 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 the presence of roll bars and uh, airbags. All these help in reducing the the, 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 the severity of the uh, of accident to in case it's an accident and those help to ameliorate uh, traumatic brain injury or to prevent traumatic brain injury. So education programs exist to lower the number of crashes and addition changes to public, uh, I mean, changes to public policy and safety laws can be made. This includes speech, uh, I mean, speed limits, seat belt and helmet laws and road engineering practices. So you see that somewhere the, the authorities need to be involved. So falls can be avoided by installing grab bars in bathrooms and uh, uh, handrails on uh, stay, uh, I mean, on stairways. Playgrounds with uh, shock absorbing surfaces such as uh, sand also prevent head injuries. And ch uh, child abuse prevention with programs to prevent shaking baby syndrome by, educated, by educating about the dangers of uh, shaking the baby is also important in the prevention. Also, supplement, we, are, we, have, we have observed that uh, supplementation with uh, omega-3 uh, offers protection against the biochemical brain damage that occurs after traumatic brain, uh, I mean, after traumatic brain injury. So let us look, uh, have an idea about the head injury in children. So trauma uh, resulting from fall or traffic accident is even emerging as a leading cause of mortality in pediatric age group. Remember that we call it as being a, a silent epidemic. So children have an incompletely developed nervous system and the, the uh, uh, prognosis of traumatic brain injury is made more complex by anatomical and the physiological variation that distinguish children from adults. So in children, the head is larger in uh, proportion to the body surface area and the stability is uh, dependent on uh, ligamentous rather than a bony structure. So because of their small, smaller stature, Children are at a significant increased risk of uh, direct brain injury as their head uh, uh, may be the site of uh, initial impact and absorption of, I mean, an absorption of a higher percentage of the forces applied. So, uh, although infants and young uh, and young children may tolerate uh, intracranial pressure increases better than adults. And on why because the, the, the sutures in the brain are not yet, uh, uh, I mean, the sutures on the, on the skull are, are not yet uh, 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 good enough. The presence of, uh, uh, they have the presence of open contaminants. And the, yes. So, uh, which, I mean, all this may manifest as a, 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 a and traumatic brain injury may manifest as, a, a, as irritability, crying, vomiting, or rarely as a electrocardiogram changes. So, this is how a traumatic brain injury manifests. In, children mostly and the assessment of neurological status are uh, more complicated in the pediatric population because of the difficulty in assessing responses to various stimuli. so uh, as such the, the gcs is modified for use in the pediatric patient and a recent study from uh, korea published in 2017 found that age surgical intervention subdural hemorrhage and diffuse abdominal injury were predictors for poorer outcomes in the pediatric population there is some sort of a modified a, a, a GCS for the children. We have a greater than one year and a less than one year. So there's some, there's some few changes to uh, the adult uh, uh, GCS. So um, let us have an idea about the complications of traumatic brain injury. The result of traumatic brain injury vary widely in type and duration, and they include physical, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral complications. So traumatic brain injury can cause prolonged or permanent effect the consciousness such as coma, brain dead, persistent vegetative state, and the minimal conscious state. And the lying still for long period can cause a complication including death of pressure source, a pneumonia, or other infection. And the progressive multiple organ failure and deep venous thrombosis which can cause pulmonary embolism can even kill the patient before the, 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 the effects of the traumatic brain injury kill the patient in case, in case, in case it happens. So, Movement disorder that may uh, develop after traumatic brain injury uh, uh, um, is one of the complications. People may lose or uh, experience altered vision, hearing, or smell. They also have hormonal disturbance uh, that may occur secondary to hypopituitarism uh, uh, occurring immediately or years after injury in the 10 to 15% uh, of traumatic 
traumatic brain injury. So it's important to screen a patient who had traumatic brain injury to uh, detect all this uh, uh, all this man secondary manifestation. And traumatic brain injury may cause emotional, social, or behavioral problems and changes in personality. So in conclusion, traumatic brain injury is an epidemic and uh, 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 carries a high mo morbidity and mortality rate. So various mechanisms are responsible for the effect of traumatic brain injury. Early onset of treatment modalities might help improve the outcome depending on the degree of severity of traumatic brain injury. Rehabilitation is crucial uh, uh, is a crucial part of traumatic brain injury treatment, so it should not be neglected. And the prognosis will depend on various factors from type of injury to comorbidities. Prevention of traumatic brain injury is vital as some, case, as some cases might not be treated, might not be treatable, or might be associated with severe complication. Also, uh, studies need to be done to find tune knowledge on traumatic brain injury and care delivery to the uh, traumatic brain uh, patient, I mean, traumatic brain injury patient. So with that said, uh, these are my references, some of them anyway, because I can not all of them. Um, and uh, I will say thank you for your attention. And it's important, uh, this uh, picture is very important because uh, uh, it says, yes, both have umbrellas, but only one is protected. Measure what matters. It is not universal health coverage unless it protects against financial hardship. Thank you very much. Okay, Zolo, thank you. Thank you very much for another exhaustive uh, presentation. That's the second one in two weeks. And just a student. Uh, I'd like to introduce a couple of panelists that came a, a little late. Uh, uh, Dylan, can you please introduce yourself? And Vlad, too, also. Go ahead, Dylan. Go ahead, Dylan. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Dylan, uh, general practitioner from Cameroon uh, and member of the Association of Future African Neurosurgeons. Nice to meet you all. Okay, thank you very much. And Vlad, could you please introduce yourself? Welcome. Greetings to everyone. My name is Vlad Yonitsam, and I'm only a fifth year student at medical school in Romania. And I'm very happy to be for participating at this presentation. Very wonderful. Yeah, Vlad, and Vlad is going to be help us edit the neurosurgery daily. <laughs> and we're going to talk about that later. And, and uh, we welcome editors because we want to put the best out there at the, at the, <laughs> at the, um, uh, convenience of tapping on the smartphone to see the latest neurosurgery news. And we want people like Vlad to curate all that's out there and help. At any rate, okay. Thank you, Zello. Uh, let's go around and, and the win. Uh, hello, hello, we get to see your picture now. Dr. Bennett, there is uh, Darwin. Go ahead. Yes. Um Hi, Dawn. We can see you. Can, can you introduce yourself again, please? We didn't see you before. Hello, uh, doctors. How? Yeah, so I was traveling. Uh, I've just uh, tried to settle down now. Uh, so I'm Darwin's chamber, fourth year medical student from uh, Copper Belt University, Zambia. Okay, very good. And welcome. Okay, any comments or questions from uh, uh, Dr. Kabulo? Go ahead. Why don't you go first? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bennett. Um, I wanted to say something about Darwin. He's a medical student in fourth year in Zambia. So I managed to spoke to him a few days ago on a Facebook account, uh, on the Facebook page. So he has a case of traumatic brain injury he managed in a research limited center. So if we have time today or maybe next week, we'll ask him to present that case. So we discuss about uh, his case. Oh, excellent. Excellent. We'd love to do that. We'd love to do that. Zolo, Zolo, thank you so much. I want to see your smile again. Ah. Yeah, can we see your face there, Zolo? Yeah, that, that big smile. Yes. Look at that smile, man. Okay. Thank you so much, Zolo. So this was fantastic. Fantastic presentation. Very good. He's got a good future as a student, man. He's got a really good future. Like Dr. Bennett said, it was exhaustive. You went through both of the things. So last week I told you to, to, to talk about the head injury. I didn't know that you were the one talking about on hydrocephalus. Because head injury is important for everyone. All doctors should know about head injury. 
if I knew that you were presenting today, I could ask you to postpone the hydrocephalus so we only go through head injury. But it doesn't matter. I will just give a few comments. Before I go to the comments, uh, I have one small question before I give my comment. The small question is, you were talking about AOA and intubation. Which patient do you intubate? Which patient with head injury do you intubate? I think a patient that we... Patient with head injury that we intubate are patient that cannot, uh, I mean, patient in coma. We have a patient who has a head injury in a coma and cannot maintain the pattern airway and so we intubate him to assist him in the respiration. Uh, so I guess uh, I, I had a hard time hearing that last part, Zolo. Could you do, repeat again? Sorry for the, for the microphone. So I said that a patient that we intubate are patients who are traumatic brain injury patients who are in coma. Okay, so loss of gag reflex would be an indication, right, so Dr. Kabulo? Then when do you talk about coma in terms of Glasgow coma scale? It's when the, 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 the GCS is below 8. Okay, when Glasgow coma scale is 8 and below, that's where you talk about coma. Those patients, we intubate them because they can't protect their airways. They don't have cough reflex they have a risk of aspiration so that's why we intubate those ones above eight you don't you don't intubate unless there is another indication but eight and below it means the patient is in coma you have to protect these airways so that was the only question i had so my few comments it's um about you said ring lactate is alternative yes people are still using uh, ring lactate as a fluid for resuscitation in head injury like I told you, uh, it depends now on the centers. Like us, we prefer a normal saline than ring lactate because the ring lactate, its osmolarity is slightly lower than plasma osmolarity. So it might worsen the edema. But other centers are still using it as the primary uh, fluid of resuscitation. So there was even a study which was done last time, like I mentioned uh, last week, uh, about ring lactate and... Um, um, and saline, but still it depends on the center where you are. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention is about the seizure prophylaxis. Seizure prophylaxis is a very important thing in head injury because um, we, we always classify seizure, post-traumatic seizure into three types. There is immediate seizure, early post-traumatic seizure, and late post-traumatic seizure. So immediate, they used to classify it as seizures, which okay within 24 hours uh, after the accident. And early, it's up to seven days. And from seven days uh, onward, it's late post-traumatic seizure. Now, these days, they tried to narrow it down like they are talking about immediate post-traumatic seizures. It, those, those seizures which occur soon after the accident, those are the immediate post-traumatic seizures. So how do you give prophylaxis? A patient who comes with uh, post-traumatic seizures, if it's immediate and early, you give anti-seizure prophylaxis for seven days. But if it's late post-traumatic seizure, you go, you give anti-seizure prophylaxis at least for one year. Then there are criteria before you stop. When do you discontinue? There are criteria for you to discontinue that. But if you, the patient has an early or immediate post-traumatic seizure, you give anti-seizure prophylaxis for seven days. After that, the patient comes back after two weeks with seizures. Then you classify them as late post-traumatic seizures. Then you continue more than a year or two years with the anti-seizure prophylaxis. And also, even those patients who didn't fit, who didn't have seizures, but they have severe traumatic brain injury, you should give anti-seizure prophylaxis. Because those patients usually, they have subclinical seizures. So you have to give prophylaxis. Um, then according to like what you mentioned, it was nice. Uh, we usually, we prefer phenytoin. Why? Because phenytoin, it's non-sedative anti-seizure. Non-sedative anti-seizure. Because if you give a sedative anti-seizure, the moment the patient 
will start to deteriorate, you won't know because the patient will be sedated. So that was my comment. The other comment is uh, on antibiotics. Antibiotics, we don't give in head injury. Uh, like you mentioned also other studies, there is no role for antibiotics unless you are taking the patient to theater for a procedure, then you give prophylaxis anti, uh, antibiotic before operation. And those impregnated catheter, uh, sometimes people don't uh, recommend to use them because they have antibiotics. The moment you get infection now in patient and you want to collect a sample to send to the lab, it will be sterile because the catheter is antibiotics. It won't grow anything when you are doing your culture. It won't grow because it, it, it is a, a antibiotic. So even like for external ventricular drain, when you are doing, um, you get traumatic brain injury with subarachnoid hemorrhage and post-traumatic hydrocephalus. You do your external ventricular drain, usually they don't prefer the one with the uh, antibiotics because if there is infection, it won't grow, grow anything because uh, the antibiotics will kill already, will kill the, the bugs. So we could spend more time on this topic, even sleep on this panel, but unfortunately you have another presentation. So I have to stop by here. I don't know if there is a comment or a question from anyone before we proceed to the next presentation. Uh, yeah. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Hello, Ivan, it was a nice presentation. Really full and no image. You know, sometimes it's good that you should put images to when you're talking about surgery, you know, uh, when you don't put images, it's cool, it's full, it's really uh, interesting, but images usually change a bit, a little bit our, you understand, it captivates a little bit more. But the question I have for you is, do you really understand what you call uh, secondary lesions or second, secondary lesions? Do you know where what second religions uh, rotates about when they call, especially the anoxic or the hypo hypoxic parts of the second religions? Thank you very much, Doctor uh, uh, Natalie, for the question. And uh, uh, okay, uh, second religion they mostly occur like uh, they, are dif they, they differ from primary uh, religion in that primary religion are what uh, have been uh, their lesions caused in the brain. By the direct trauma, like the agent causing the trauma is responsible for the primary injury. Like uh, when maybe they say blue, what happens at the instant is the primary injury. All the distortion that happens, the axonality and all the rest. Now, secondary uh, lesions that 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 occur, uh, are these ones are those lesions that occur as a result of uh, um, what the primary injury caused. Like maybe it's going to alter the permeability of the uh, of the uh, blood vessels in the brain. It's going to alter the uh, uh, the availability of oxygen supply to the brain, and all these are what causes the secondary injury to the nerve tissue. So these come as a result of uh, 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 altered in the physiology of the brain. So that's what I. Understand. Okay, very good. Let to tell you that. Um... Do you know the formula to calculate the cerebral uh, perfusion pressure? The formula. Do you know what, how do they calculate the cerebral perfusion pressure? Oops, Zolo. Zolo, unmute yourself. You're, you're muted, Zolo. Sorry, sorry. 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 Yeah, so the cerebral perfusion pressure is calculated by the subtracting the, uh, the intracranial pressure from the mean arterial pressure. Yeah, she Thank wasn't you. there last Saturday. We understand. <laughs> no, I I just wanted to tell him that. No, I know. I just wanted to tell him that you gave us some values about uh, the BTF, which they came out for people who are less than 60 and those who are greater than 70. If you come out with somebody who is having, for example, you give us some fixed values of the blood pressure that that person should have. I just want to say that if you come out, if uh, you come, if a person who is like hypertensive has a trauma, do you think it would be better for him to be kept within those values or it'd be better for you to calculate the, the CPP by yourself Using your intracranial pressure, uh, your intracranial pressure and your mean arterial pressure. 
Yes. Thank you very much for the question, Dr. Natalie. I think uh, given that the patient is already uh, so the hypertensive the patient, his uh, physiology is altered. So I would rather calculate uh, the, the, the value for the patient. I would not use the standard ones because the patient with hypertension, even in the management, maybe when they have to be an emergency or urgency, we try to keep the values within a particular range. So we don't try to keep them in the normal range. We just try to Okay, thank you. Uh, well, Dr. Gabula, Dr. Gabula, could you comment on that question by Nathalie? Did you hear the question? Uh, do you want to? Did you, you comment on, on, on that, Let Natalie's question? Could you comment on that? And yes, maybe Natalie. come again. Yeah, could you uh, repeat uh, the question for Dr. Gabula? I was asking Zolo that is it not better for you to calculate the CPP yourself, depending on the patient that you have? Because what I wanted to add to Zolo is that exactly you said that there are, there are changes that they call uh, in French they call it axos. There are different uh, metabolisms which have changed. You can find yourself having a patient who is either hypotensive. You can have a patient because of uh, cerebral trauma, or you can have a person having either normal uh, uh, blood pressure or higher, even higher blood pressure due to the consequence. So we, instead of taking those values that the BTF takes, I was asking him, is it not better for you to calculate yourself and estimate that if the CPP remains between 60 and 70, I think that it should remain there. It should be it is, it's ideal. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Natalie. Uh, those values they are giving you the range like what he said from 50 to 70 it means if it's below that you will get cerebral ischemia it means you calculate yourself then you check is the value between the range or it's below or it's above so you have everyone you have to calculate you have to calculate because they won't give you the, the, the cerebral perfusion pressure. You have to check from the map. You have to check the ICP. Then you take map minus ICP. You get your cerebral perfusion pressure. Then you check the range he gave. Is the value within the range or not? Then you decide to say, OK, this one is normal or it's not normal. I don't know if you get it. Whatever he said, it doesn't mean that all patients have to be there. No, it's just the range of normal cerebral perfusion pressure. Then you, you calculate your patient and check now is the value normal or not i don't know if i answered okay, did you okay. Hear that? yeah it's okay okay now i have a question for you dr kabulo okay. me in cameroon i've never seen um i've never seen anywhere being measured the icp being measured what are the other alternatives that we have to measure the icp because also we don't have the machines for that. We don't have the, 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 the tools for that. Yeah, that, that, that's common. Uh, in Africa, many centers don't have uh, ICP monitoring. So what we do sometimes is to do what is called neuro observation. Neuro observations where you are checking your BPs, your PAUs, your Glasgow Coma Scale, your pupils. So, you do those things and see if the patient is deteriorating or not. If you are taking the patient to theater, then during operation, if you want to put, for example, a, an external ventricular drain, then you can measure from there in theater using the catheter you're going to, 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 to place in the ventricle. So not every, every center has, have, uh, uh, center has have, have ICU monitoring, uh, ICP monitoring, sorry. So, Sometimes we just do neuro observations, like I said. But in other centers where they have uh, almost everything, they do. But not every patient, again, requires what? Uh, ICP monitoring. There are indications which one to do ICP monitoring, which one not to do. OK. Then, yeah. um, now it's for Zulu. Zulu, I just wanted to tell you that when a patient who has a, this is just an addition. When a patient has a traumatic brain injury, when he goes out of the hospital, 
you have to make what you call the Glasgow Coma Outcome Scale. Do you know about it? Did you hear that, Dr. Kabulo? No, no, Glasgow Outcome Scale. Outcome Scale, Glasgow yeah, outcome sorry. Scale. Yes, yes. Scale. yes, yes, yes. Right. Yes, yes, I, I, I read, I read over it some, some, some while ago. I just forgot to, to, to include it in the presentation. Sorry. Yes. Thank, thank you, very you much. thank you very much. That, that's very important. Uh, when you are discharging your patient, you have to know the Glasgow Outcome Score, a discharge, or you can review a patient after one month and check the Glasgow Outcome Score. There is a modified one. Thank you. Uh, okay. I have a follow-up question. Go ahead. Go ahead, Darwin. Uh, yeah. um, so Dr. Natalie uh, mentioned uh, about uh, hypertensive patient. Um, so I would want to find out which patient is uh, uh, more adv uh, advantaged, hypertensive patient or hypotensive patient? Because we know that uh, uh, CPP depends on uh, the blood pressure, which is uh, systolic blood pressure and uh, diastolic blood pressure. So in a patient who has a hypertension, are they more advantaged in a case of traumatic brain injury or maybe they're disadvantaged? Because in the calculation of uh, mean arterial pressure, we use systolic blood pressure and uh, diastolic blood pressure. Thank, thank you, Darwin, for that question. That's a very good question. Uh, hypertension you have to avoid in a patient with a head injury. Because if the patient gets hypo, hypotension, hypovolemia, the prognosis will be poor. But hypertension is actually good in patients with traumatic brain injury. That's why they get pushing triad. Because the more you get elevated systolic blood pressure, the more you are improving your cerebral perfusion pressure. That's why they say a patient with severe traumatic brain injury, you don't lower with a pushing triad, you don't lower your systolic blood pressure below 160, 140. No, it's contraindicated because that high blood pressure is helping you with cerebral, to, to, to maintain cerebral perfusion pressure. Did you get me? Yes, I, I, I've, I've got the new one. Uh, Hypertension is better so than hypotension, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Sure. Okay, okay. Uh, I, have a, I have a, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Darwin, go ahead. Go ahead, Darwin, you have a, another Darwin, question? You have another question? I think we lost his audio. Well, while we're waiting yeah. to get reconnect with Darwin, I, I have a comment. As an ex-emergency physician, I, I'm not a neurosurgeon, we used yeah. to see patients come into the emergency room that had therapeutic levels of dilantin, even, but they had seizures. Uh, and they've, they've discovered through genomics that some people metabolize dilantin well, and some don't metabolize it at all. So in other words, they're resistant to the effects of dilantin. In that case, have you seen many patients, post-traumatic brain people that still have seizures, even though they have a therapeutic level of dilantin? Have you seen, Sorry, any, have you seen any patients that still have seizures, even though their dilantin level is, is good, is therapeutic? Have you seen many yes. patients like that? Yes, yes. We do have patients like that. Yeah, because you know they've discovered that some people don't metabolize dilantin well, and you have okay. to use an alternative. What alternative yeah, so. drug do you suggest in that scenario? Okay, in that one, like the liver test. Yeah, the one that doesn't the dilantin doesn't affect, doesn't help stop the seizures. Yeah. Yes, then you can you can go with carbamazepine. Okay. Yes. It's but, uh, also uh, do you try to avoid the Valium because it obtuns the patient uh, briefly? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because mm -hmm. it makes the patient drowsy, and you don't know why they're sure. drowsy. You don't want the drug to sure. cause the drowsiness. Yeah. Even even phenytoin, we don't give it for long period because it has effect on cognitive. Maybe to stop a status, right? Yes. Like status oh, long time, yes. Okay. Okay, Dr. Natalie. Yes, I was saying that I've also seen used um, valproate sodium. Yes. Or yes. I don't know what you think about that. Yes. We, 
Yes, but phenobarb usually uh, we avoid because it's sedative, especially when the patient is still uh, admitted. We are fearing like the patient will be sedated, the patient will be deteriorating. You will think like it's the sedation due to phenobarb. You get my point? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, so it's better to use non sedative uh, anti seizure. Is that I don't remember having ever seen phenytoin in Cameroon actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just like, <laughs> I'm just like, I, I don't think I've even ever seen it because even um, when I was, we were doing a presentation on epilepsy, mm -hmm. I remember they were talking much more about phenytoin, but yeah, seriously. We use either uh, benzodiazepines or barbiturics or, or, I don't know, carbamazepine, but really I've never yeah. seen phenytoin in camera. Yeah, sure. Phenytoin is not like even in my country in Lubumbashi when I was there last time, I could not find phenytoin. So I got a patient, I was using carbamazepine. Okay, uh, we're having another presentation, uh, Zolo. I wasn't sure whether you guys are going to do another one. Are you going to do another presentation or that's it? No, there is there is a presentation of acute hydrocephalus. I have the presentation. If uh, it's possible, let's... Then, uh, sure, sure. I... But, but let me let me end this one formally and then we'll start the hydrocephalus one, okay? Can, can I ask a question to Darwin? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, Darwin? Yeah, yeah sure. Go ahead, Darwin. Okay. Yes, Darwin, yes. Uh, your case, how long do you think you can present that case you managed? Uh, I think ma uh, much of uh, much of the uh, uh, much of it has been uh, talked about by uh, uh, Zolo. So I think it's just a few things, a few highlights of how we manage the patient and some of the challenges uh, that are usually faced uh, in our setting. Because I had the suggestion, Dr. Bennett, since we are talking about traumatic brain injury, Darwin case is uh, brain injury. If we can give him five to ten minutes just to give us a case presentation, how that patient presented, how they managed the case, then we move on to hydrocephalus. I don't know. Uh, that's just a suggestion. What, do you want to have a separate presentation uh, next week, maybe, on that? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It's yeah, 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 even, okay. That, even that is fine as well. It's fine. Yeah, that would be good because uh, because I guess uh, Zolo has the hydrocephalus presentation planned. Yeah. So let's go let's go with that, and next week uh, Darwin can include that in the presentation. Okay, sure, no problem. Okay, and we'll we'll teach you how to screen share and how to use this platform. Uh, any comments, Vlad, or you want to say anything? You don't have to. You can just say thank you very much. No, oh. thank you very much. As I said, it's <laughs> okay, quite a honor it. for me. Uh, I wrote as much as possible about everything that Zol has said because it was very detailed. Yeah, I mean, he went from drug uh, uses to nutrition and everything. It was well, very nice. Well, it's it's yeah. great that you guys are going over this now because you're going to have to learn it. As Dr. Kabulo knows, knows, you have to learn it. And just by <laughs> repeating it again and again is great. It's, it's really yeah. good. So let's end this formally, and then we'll go on to the hydrocephalus. So thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Now I'm going to record again here. Okay, we're gonna do the go on to hydrocephalus, right, uh, Zolo? Is I Zolo think he went there? out. He has a connection problem. Oh, okay. We'll just hang in there. We'll just hang in there. Uh, yeah, I didn't expect a double whammy. That's great. That's great. If he wants to do it, great. I don't know how he prepares all this stuff. <laughs> when he has the time, how do you, the, he finds the time? He must spend a lot of time. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, you, you must see a lot of trauma, Dr. Gabulo, right? And 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 uh, Zimbabwe, and uh, do you see a lot of lot, lot of trauma? Yes, we have a lot of trauma, and uh, in our program, when you are in third year, you only do trauma. Okay, it's and mostly it's car accidents or or animal yes. injuries. Sure. Yes, we get a lot of accidents here. Yeah. 
yeah, because I was watching a special in Zimbabwe uh, in the northwest mm -hmm. corner. They have an animal reserve. That's where the wildebeest go through the across the river. And it's a mm -hmm. it's a big uh, every year. It's a big event. And cool. uh, I'm sure a lot of tourists get injured uh, from uh, from being run over by animals. Um, sure. Have you seen have you seen many uh, tourists injured by animals in Africa? Yes. Okay. And, and what's the nature? Mostly tra traumatic brain injury. Sorry. What is, what is the nature of the injury? Traumatic or penetrating wound, a horn or something? Okay, it, it depends on the area where you are. Like okay. that area close to South Africa, you get too, too many penetrating brain injuries. Okay. Because there are many cases of assault. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sometimes you get a patient with a nail in the brain, a knife, an X. So okay. That side will get um, penetrating brain injury. But this side where we are, usually it's traumatic. Uh, it's due to motor vehicle accident. Okay. Yes. Okay. Could you check with Zolo? I don't know where he went. <laughs> <laughs> the speaker disappeared. Yeah, we have uh, Natalie. I hope. I hope tomorrow. Can you hear me, Natalie? Tomorrow, we women's neurosurgery. You better come to that. Are you going to come? I'll be there. I'll be there. Uh, yeah, yeah, because you're going to you get a chance to meet some leading neuro women neurosurgeons. Uh, one from India was what, of course Anila Darbar. She's a big one from Pakistan. She's now in St. Louis, uh, she, but she goes back to Pakistan to teach. <laughs> because she really wants to help neurosurgery teaching in Pakistan. So she brings a lot of attention uh, to that, uh, to the women and, and especially Pakistani women in, in neurosurgery. What, what time is it starting? This is tomorrow at five o'clock, no, three o'clock India time. I think it'd be around 11 or 12 uh, in, in Zimbabwe, around there. Okay. Yeah, I'll, let I'll, me. I'll, I'll be there. I'll oh, be okay, there. great, great. Let me show you the presentations while we're waiting for for uh, okay. for uh, Zolo to come back. Okay, everybody, there's tomorrow's uh, lineup. Uh, all complications in neurosurgery. It does, you don't have to be a woman to be there. You you know, it's obviously these topics for everybody. Uh, anterior okay. circulation complications and giant aneurysm clipping complication in posterior circulation, complications in endovascular. This gentleman's from Japan. He's a, he's a very big neurosurgeon in Japan. Uh, so we have a good lineup here. Roberto from Argentina. Uh, he's a big he's a big neurosurgeon in Argentina. So we have quite a lineup. Pakistan, India, Argentina, USA. She's at Rutgers, Japan, uh, UK, University of uh, uh, excuse me, um, United Kingdom. I'm going to orient her in a few minutes. Sharon from Malaysia, quite a, quite a lineup. So, uh, and hopefully we get, you know, because be, I was talking to a female neurosurgeon, is, you know, a lot of female neurosurgeons, they want to go to a women's neurosurgery conference to support women, but a lot of them, you know, already have gone to a, a conference and they can't go to more than two a year or three a year. But going on the internet will allow them to participate in the women's activities. Uh, do you know what I'm saying, Natalie? Because, because yeah, because some women prefer like, well, I, I've already gone to a general neurosurgery in China or somewhere, and I can't go to another one. But being on the internet will allow them, I think, I think to potentially expand their community more than they do now, I, I think. But we'll see. We'll see. Meanwhile, Zolo. I'm sorry. Zolo has a connection problem. I just contacted him. So oh, okay. I was trying. can we schedule it for next Friday? There's no... Yeah, operation. that would be fine because Zolo's done a lot of work. We, we, we can't overwork Zolo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's, he's, he's done a lot. So so if you get in touch with him, thank him. And uh, we'll do it. We'll do it next week. And we'll also do Dawin. 
presentation. Okay, Dr. Cabullo? Yeah. And the, the, he Hello, can Dr. present. Yeah, yeah, Dr. DeWin can present next week, okay? It's okay. It's okay. Okay, thank you all you for coming, and maybe we'll see you tomorrow. Thank yes. you very much. Uh, th thank you so much. Okay, you can. Uh, I'm just going to stay here with uh, Vlad to go over some things, and you guys are welcome to stay. I'm going to show him how to be an editor for for into, for neurosurgery news, which we publish every day. And let, let me show you guys that that um, uh, newsletter we promise we we publish every day, and and how everyone's welcome to be an editor, uh, and I'll show you how easy it is. Okay, let me just. I'm waiting for the to load. This is embarrassing, man. Okay, you see. Um, okay, let me share the screen now. Okay, okay. On the Neurosurgery TV site, there's an Neurosurgery Daily News. Now, this is the newspaper that Vlad and others are going to help me curate. Okay, this is. Basically, we try to put relevant stories from your browsing on the net uh, to put on this paper. And I, I think Vlad, Vlad has already put a couple, or Saad. Saad is a neurosurgeon from Pakistan. He wants to be an editor, and he just put a few articles in. You see his name. He, he put these two articles in. Now, the way he put them in, I'm going to show you how easy it is. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to a, a neurosurgery article. Let's see. Let me just get to a neurosurgery article. No. Okay, I'll get an article that. Okay, an article from here, latest research. Okay, the, this uh, this article. Suppose I'm browsing, right, and want to put this article in the news, neurosurgery news. I have installed on my taskbar. You see this paper plus sign, right? Yeah. That's installed in my browser. So I click on that, and if I'm if I'm a collaborator like Vlad is. Uh, uh, well, I can't get the, uh, it's perfect. Uh, perfect. Couldn't find any content on the paper. Okay, I can't use that paper, so I go to another paper. <clears throat> suppose, suppose I go to neurosurgery TV and I want to put I want to put the, this newscast that we just did on. Okay, what I do uh, is go go to the article. Okay, which is right now we just did this. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to I'm going to put this on. OK, so I go to the paper, the bookmark on my taskbar. Another window opens up over here and it asks me to, what paper I want to put in. I want to put a neurosurgery daily. I add that article to the paper and I'll show you where it goes on the paper. It goes immediately uh, on the paper. Dr. Uh, Bennett, only one question. Yes. The main, the main problem I had with paper is that I don't know how to put it this tab, you know, in the task. Okay, part. okay, I'm going to show you how to do that. Okay, yeah. but you see the article now? It's placed there. It's it's right there. You see it right there? The article we just put it there. See, John, I just uh, yeah. put it there. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, and and uh, that's essentially how you do it. How you how you add? You know, I think if we get some a good good group of editors every day will have fresh stories that are good that are seen by a neurosurgeon or resident or student that has a pretty good idea of what a good article is you know we're going to make mistakes sure but so what okay but uh this is essentially uh how to okay and let me show you how to i'm going to send you a video uh vlad about how to put the bookmarklet on your on your browser, okay? Okay, okay. Okay, and that'll that'll show you how to uh, lead it through, and and it'll put it. Um, a matter of fact, I'll go. I'll, let me go right now. And the, I have another question. I've yeah. managed to log in into Paperly with my Facebook account, 
and okay. how how can you in, introduce me as a co-editor for your because, page? Because once you're entered into the the, the LI, paper li Facebook, uh, it shows up when I search for a collaborator. Now let me show you where. Mm. Okay, this may get a little technical for you guys. I don't know if you want to see this, but let me show Vlad how how you you uh, get in. Okay, I want to get in. Okay, now now since I'm an editor, just like you, Vlad, we get the edit and and we get we can edit it, right? So mm -hmm. when I edit it, and, and I want to find, I want to find the collaborators. Okay, this this is on my settings. You see this collaborator option for me? Yeah, exactly. Once I, once I click that, you're you're if you have joined, I'm gonna put Vlad. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna put you there. Okay, but uh, that, so you're not you're not listed yet. You know what I mean? I, if once you once you list you know, on the paper ally, you'll be there, and I'll be able to add you. You can do it right now. Just okay, so, join join that with that link I showed you to paper ally. Okay, just one moment. Yeah, and we'll, we'll sh you guys will be able to see it. How I add him as a collaborator. And you, everyone, Dr. Gabulo and, and Natalie, you're welcome to become editors also. Uh, you don't have to do it every day, but just now and then, if you're looking at the good stuff, you say, hey, this would be good good news for the neurosurgery community. I'm going to put this on the news, Neurosurgery <laughs> Daily. Okay. Uh, Dr. Beta, uh, Bennett, where have you sent me the share link? Okay, let me, let me see here. Let me see here. Let me, let me just give me a second here. <laughs> Oh, there he is. Okay, okay. Okay, I'm going to show. <sighs> Meeting Passable, sorry. Okay. Okay, here it is. You, we're gonna watch this video to, uh, okay, I uh, see, uh, see this link? Add content, add publish, book market. Uh, okay, I'm gonna send this article to you, uh, Vlad. Maybe I didn't send it to you, okay? And this is for anyone else who, I'm gonna put it in the chat box. This, If anybody wants to uh, edit, just you can put a book booklet on your uh, taskbar and, and become an editor. Uh, <clears throat> so just uh, read over that link, Vlad, and, and then it'll show you how to put. Uh, but the, the, the way, okay, the way I'm going to show you how to become, so you, I'm going to show you the link to go to right now on, on Facebook, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and once you do, I'll lead you through that so that. For for example, I I went on Neurosurgical TV. No, no, I no, no. paper. No, no, it's not Neurosurgical TV. It's Paper Li. Okay. This is. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you what I'm where I'm exactly where I'm going. Okay, I'm gonna show you right now in a <laughs> in a share. Okay, here is. Okay, you see the paper li pay, Facebook account? Yeah, I can. Okay, see that. Then, then you go there, and now if you sign up, you see this sign up here. Oh. Okay. Sign up there at this at this address, Facebook uh, slash yes. dot com dash paper dot li. Once you sign up, mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. it'll show up when I look for you. 
you'll yeah. be a part of the of the community and go so go do that right now do that right now and i'll be able to see you almost immediately okay. go to go to paper.li facebook and sign up and, and i'm going to go to the uh, to the uh, paper my paper and okay so i've entered it right yep. now Okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you're gonna watch me search for it. You're gonna see it. Okay, this is the first time I've done this live. Okay. Hold on. Collaborators, and now I type your name in. You should come up. Whoop. Did you did you sign sign in to uh, paper.li on Facebook? I've signed in, but that is not my name. I oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got the wrong Vladimir. Okay, I'm sorry that he's a he's a researcher from Buffalo. He's given a couple presentations on artificial intelligence and uh, and aneurysms. Okay, oh, Vladimir. Nice. I'm sorry. The last no, name. No. It, it's only Vlad, only Vlad without Vlad. Vlad in there. Okay. Vlad. I O N I T A. Okay. okay. Now, okay, this should show up. There you are. Yeah. Okay. Add. Okay. You're now an editor. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank there you, you go. And now you just browse, and we, once you have the bookmark <laughs> on there, it's easy. To, okay. to post stories uh and you'll you'll get to know it you'll get to know yeah. it and thank uh, you very much dr bennett yeah yeah and you other guys if you want to do it you know you don't have to <coughs> I, know you, I know you're busy but you know some people just like to curate and and i know i run across stuff all the time that this makes it super easy to put something on there i don't have to copy it and paste it on another site, I just click that button, cl make a few more clicks, boom, it's there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Bennett. Yeah. And yeah. Also, uh, congrats to Zolo. It yeah, yeah, Zolo. He, he, man, he, he put in a great presentation. And, and the guy yeah. is in a, ba a poor bandwidth area with a smartphone. Now, how good is that? <laughs> you know, how good is that? I mean, that he, he's doing it. He's doing it. He's not, he's not held back by limitations. And in a way, we're doing a lot of these things, even though they're not technically very polished, but that's okay. We're learning. We're learning. There will be a day as wireless gets better and better that we'll be ready because we will have already seen the bad times, seen the times with bad connections, <laughs> and, and we're just going to get better and better and better. Uh, yeah. every, people will join later, which I, I don't blame them. Because sometimes they people want things pretty perfect, and unless it's perfect, they don't want to have anything to do with it. Especially Americans, you know. I know that they're spoiled. I know Americans. I'm spoiled too. We're <laughs> used to getting, you know, we're used to getting top quality this and top quality that, and and we turn our nose up if someone else doesn't give it, and and that's not a good attitude. I th I think, I think, but anyways, whatever. Whatever I, I can't I can't make everyone love what I love, <laughs> you know, about exploring the video field. Uh, yeah, we're doing that good the Pakistani one tomorrow, uh, and uh, I'm doing a bunch of interviews of with young innovators in medicine, young not just neurosurgery, but uh, in uh, let me show you let me show you the people we're gonna have interviews with. Uh, these are kids that have that are that are inventing and in medical devices uh, with epilepsy and uh, artificial intelligence and radiology. I mean, these kids are really doing exciting stuff. Uh -oh. yeah. And they're, they've won prizes, and they're going to present at the biggest conference in the world in Las Vegas on medical devices. So the so the work is being rewarded. Okay, let me let me just show you the. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to show you the page where they're at. One 
not showing the screen. There it is. Okay, let me. Share this. Okay, this is this is the uh, young innovators. Okay, now these are uh, these are people, kids in high school and college. This young girl, she works for uh, Project Purple, which is an organization which tries to uh, diagnose cancer early, and, and she's working on that. And this gentleman is using uh, artificial intelligence, uh, reading x-rays at Stanford, one of the top digital schools in the world. But he's doing research on applying artificial intelligence to read x-rays, which it's determined that it's more accurate than radiologists. A lot of readings are more accurate than radiologists. And they're, of all the specialties, they're incorporating artificial intelligence more than others. Dermatology is another one too. Uh, that will be the, the computer program will be taught what a malignant lesion looks like on the skin, and they analyze millions of images, and they learn and they get better. These programs, with the more they read, and they beating pathologists at diagnosing too. So the writing's on the wall with some some specialties, especially image-based specialties like derm, dermatology, and, uh, and radiology. They're image-based, and, and machines can learn by reading millions of images, just like we learn when we learn, we learn thousands of images, not millions, thousands. But uh, anyways, well, we're going to be interviewing these kids in the next month or two. We, all you guys are welcome to participate in, 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 in those uh, uh, conferences also mm -hmm. yeah there's that would be very nice but uh, yeah if you want to you know if, if you're into just neurosurgery we we'll hope to have i want to have tw neurosurgery 24 hours a day <laughs> just like just like the crime channel you know the crime we have crime channels here in in the united <laughs> states 24 hours a day why not medicine 24 hours a day <laughs> that you can watch I mean, Christ, we watch crime 24 hours. We can watch medicine, certainly. I mean, not, you know, now and then watch it. But, I mean, at least have the option. Hey, I'm going to watch this on uh, radiology. I'm going to watch this one on genomics. You know, it's possible. It's possible because the days of televising have changed. Anybody with a desktop can be televised events. Anybody. Anybody. You don't have to have a studio, a truck, uh, wires, You've already got the network built. It's it's called the internet. It's already built. You just got to build something that will interest people. That'll bring them to where you say it's the shows are going to be. Uh, so, you know that's where we're heading. Yeah, uh, Doctor Bennett, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I have to leave. Okay, thank very you good. Once again, doctors, for the explanation given and. Also, again, congrats to Zolo. Yes, I will. <laughs> yes, I will. He's a hard worker, man. Yeah, I can, I can also feel it. Right okay. There. Thank you, Vlad. Thank, thank you for your help. Thank you also. Goodbye. Have a good night or day. Okay, or... you too. Okay. Goodbye. You too. Well, Natalie, that's a good background. And, and Dr. Gabulo, she didn't even put a picture of. That's a good background. I can't hear you, Natalie. Let me, let me unmute you there. Dr. Kabula, the background is his face. Can you see? You can see that, Dr. Kabula, right? I said that the cat is behind. Yeah, now that's Dr. Kabula. Yeah, well, that's a real background, right? That's that's real life, right? Yeah. Is, was... is, that a, is that a picture or is that the real background? Behind? Yeah. No, it's a real background. Oh, I that's a real that... background. I, I thought that was a picture or something. No. Really good. It's very, no, it's real. Um, well, I was just saying uh, to Dr. Kabul, I talked to, uh, I wanted to talk about, um, we have um, a, what we call an association here 
which I wish to present at the uh, Neurosurgical TV. It doesn't have anything to do with Neurosurgical TV, but I don't know if I can present it here so that one day, I don't know, just like that, five minutes. What, what do you want to present, Natalie? Natalie? Uh, let me just uh, give you a picture okay. of uh, what we do. I just want to talk about this man. Let me share it. Excuse me. Share the screen. I don't know how, uh, are you seeing what I'm sharing? Yeah, I see him, I see him. Yeah, I don't know if you have ever heard about Dr. George Boyle. No. no. Boom, Dr. Josh Bolle is a, a general surgeon, a visceral surgeon in Cameroon who um, has a narcissistian called Ascovin. He was a CNN hero in 2013. And Dr. George Bolle, the, the name is uh, Association de Competence pour une vie meilleure, donc, uh, Association of Competence for a Better Life. So usually when I'm not there during weekends, is that uh, during weekends we travel to rural areas to um, give uh, medical uh, support or medical treatment or even operate for free if we don't have the money for. So uh, this time around during uh, January, uh, during uh, September to November, all we do is that we share books to the less privileged. So we go to distant towns. So last week we were here at Buddha, a, a village where we offered uh, free, free uh, books in fact, three books, uh, um, as you see, computers and and other school items to students who do not have the means. Well, I would love to televise that, uh, Natalie. Yes. I would I would love to, uh, because you know this platform can be used in any part of medicine. Uh, so this are the people. And I, would, I, would I would love to televise that, and I can put it on internetmedicine.com. Okay. Okay. I can put it on not a neurosurgical, but whatever area of medicine is we put it well uh, let me show you uh, okay i'll show you how we have we're really already set up for any type of uh okay. of, of presentation and let me Thanks share this let me, yeah let me let me and I'll, I'll be glad to show him when he wants you if he wants to also books <laughs> can i <laughs> we give to the really the less privilege you know our country is facing some some crisis uh, mm -hmm. Since 2016, or even 2014, where uh, there are people who have migrated from zones, so, so we just okay. go and. Okay, okay. He's a, okay. here's the uh, website where it would go internetmedicine.com. Okay. okay, we go okay. under the specialties. Okay, there's a surgery, surgery option, and then where we go to, we go to the studio of surgery, which is here which is here that's where it would go it would go in this studio here which we're going to do for neurosurgery too we're going to make the the interface better so that for example when dr cabullo gives a presentation people will be able to ask questions we'll put his profile there we'll put his contact info and maybe a website that he oh. he you does and maybe a topic review and connect to the surgery form and put name on the mailing list, request a panel spot, request a webcast and the schedule. So we have it set up. We're just waiting for the world to wake up. I just wanted to say it doesn't have anything to do with surgery particularly. Okay, well, no, what, okay what, what, is the, what is the topic? It is much more of a uh, humanitarian work. That's what we do during weekends. We do have something to do we just go okay on. well we'll find a place for it we'll find a place okay. for it okay and uh maybe just a general one the just general presentation and we'll put it on okay. we'll put it on the front page of of uh, that of that website okay. so we certainly welcome anybody that likes the platform on in any specialty it, it just okay. so happens that now uh, I'm concentrating on neurosurgery because they seem to be the most open because we've done them before and people have heard it, but certainly we're, we're, we're open to anyone that wants to explore the platform as a means of education. Okay. And we're working on the app. The app has a lot of problems, but you know, that's the way it is when you have a new platform, you have 
bugs. You got to work. Even Facebook had bugs when they first started. <laughs> and those guys have pretty good engineers. Uh, so uh, we'll figure that out. And uh, okay, guys, thank you very okay. much. Thank well, you very much, Jim. Beth, Nathalie. Thank you, Dr. Have a, good, have a good day, you guys. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.